Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Disney Publishing Preview. I'm Sarah Hunter, Booklist's Bo Books for Youth Editor. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have any questions or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Also, Booklist will now be offering closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle headings. Last but not least, links to today's slide presentation and title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the links located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. We have a great program in store for you today. For the first half of the webinar, you'll hear read alouds and more from six fabulous authors. For the second half, we'll be hosting an interactive quiz based on those presentations. To prepare for and participate in that quiz, open https colon slash slash kahoot, that's K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T in either a separate window or on your computer or your uh, separate window on your computer or on your phone. From there, you'll enter the game pin, which Disney's Dina Sherman will kindly provide before we begin, and your name. To answer each question, you'll select the symbol that, co that corresponds to the correct response. Remember, answers to many of the questions asked will be revealed in the first half of the webinar, so listen close to those author presentations and get ready to compete. The top scoring attendees will receive a special prize. But first, let's introduce our wonderful panelists. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Kendara Blake, Ryan T. Higgins, Lori M. Lee, Pam Munoz Ryan, Ronald L. Smith, and Andrea Surumi. First, we'll hear from Andrea Surumi. Andrea is the author and illustrator of Accident and Crab Cake, as well as numerous comics. She illustrated Not Your Nest by Gideon Stair and Girls Who Quote by Reshma Saujani. She was born and raised in New York, where she got an MFA from the School of Visual Arts, and she now lives in Philadelphia with her spouse and their dog. When she's not inventing croissant-based animals, she likes reading about ordinary and ridiculous history. Take it away, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Brianna, for that introduction. Thank you, Disney Hyperion, for hosting this, and uh, Mo for co-writing this book. So to get right into it, uh, here are some wonderful goats from the Philly Goat Project, a local goat group that kindly provided uh, very important goat research. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it also, in addition to that, provides grazing, education, therapy, and just generally a great goat time for uh, folks in the Philly area. And before I read the book, I uh, just wanted to say the idea behind it came from, you know, just watching and thinking about being on a playground and how a playground is like a whole world, right? Uh, you have kids, you know, off playing ball, off uh, playing pretend, and even within the same group of tag, you might have five different kids playing the same thing in completely different ways. And that's the great thing about play, right? It's this constant push and pull and uh, back and forth about who are we to each other? Next goat, please. Uh, who says there's one way to do things and maybe we don't have to do all the things all the same way all the time. Uh, maybe there are so many, well, there are so many different ways to be in the world. Please move on to the next goat. Uh, and then mostly I, I wanted to show you more goats because honestly, who can ever have enough goats in their lives? Next goat. Ah, yes. Speaking of play, if you put an object in front of goats, they will try to climb it. <laughs> and this wheelbarrow did not stay upright for long. Next goat, please. I think we're almost at the end of the goats. Uh, and next goat might be the book. Nope, one more headbutt. Kind of overdid it on the goats. Thank you for staying with me. <laughs> uh, next goat. Or next slide. And here we go. So uh, without further ado, let's get into I'm on it. Next slide. And next slide, please. How are you, Gerald? I feel a little off. Well, if you want 
help finding a book to cheer you up. Next, I'm on it. Right on. Look at me, frog. Okay, goat. I'm on it. Ooh. Huh. Hey, you know what? Splash. I'm on it too. But now I'm on it and beside it. Okay, I'm on it and beside it too. But now I'm on it and beside it and inside it. I'm on it and beside it and inside it too. Splash, eek. Look at me now, I'm on it and between these. I'm on it and between these two. Watch this. Now I'm on it between this and under this. On it between these, under this, two. On it between these, under this, and across from you. Across from you, two. Now watch me go along this. Oh, I'm in two. I'm also above it, above it too. But are you through it? Yes. Watch me, I'm on it, along it, above it, inside it, through it, and around it. Me too. I'm so high up. I am also very high up. Frog, goat, are you ready? Oh, I am near it and I am far from it. Now I am far from it and I am near it. I am so into this. I am so not into this. Frog, you're off of it. Splash, yep. I am over it. Ha! Huh. Hey, you know what? I am over it too. Thank you all very much. Oh, look, Piggy is on this book. Now I'm under it. Silly. I saved the best for last. Yes, Piggy? Now we are both in it. Far out. It's a wonderful recursive page. So in it, in, in, in. Thanks. Take care. Thank you so much, Andrea. Next up, we have Ronald L. Smith. Ronald is an award-winning writer of children's literature, including the middle grade novels, Black Panther, The Young Prince, The Mesmerist, The Owls Have Come to Take Us Away, and Gloomtown, a junior library guild selection. His first novel, Hoodoo, earned him the 2016 Coretta Scott King John Steptoe New Talent Author Award and the International Literacy Association Award for Intermediate Fiction. Before he became a full-time writer, he worked in advertising and wrote TV commercials for big corporations. He is much happier writing books for young people. Thanks for joining us today, Ronald. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me here. This is a lot of fun. Um, thanks for the wonderful introduction. You know, I really like writing for middle grade audiences because I remember that time when I was a kid, you know, reading. I was a kid in the back of the classroom, reading, reading, reading when I was supposed to be paying attention. But I turned out somewhat okay, I think. Um, but I like writing for middle grade because I think it's that time in your life, in a child's life, when you still got that little bit of like belief that there's some magic in the world. You know, maybe there is a wardrobe that's going to lead me to Narnia. Maybe I'm going to get a delivery from an owl uh, inviting me to Hogwarts. Uh, I'm still waiting for my my owl. But that's why I like writing for middle grade. I just feel it's a really sweet spot and it, it really works well for me. And it's it's the voice that I feel most comfortable with. And with that, my latest middle grade novel is Spellbound. Black Panther, Spellbound. And the first book was called Black Panther, The Young Prince. And this is Spellbound. It's not really a continuation of the same story. It's a sequel. 
uh, same characters, same central characters, but a whole new adventure. And this, the first book took place in Chicago where I lived for 15 years. And this one is in the deep South in Alabama. And young T'Challa, who's 13 now, he meets up with his friends, Zeke and Sheila, who I introduced in the first book. Zeke is a skinny geek who likes reading comic books and writing, and he likes uh, graphic novels. Uh, Sheila is a science, tech, math geek who's really smart and super cool. And uh, T'Challa goes to visit them in Alabama on summer vacation. And I know Alabama because my first book, Hoodoo, takes place in Alabama. And my family is from that area of the South. So I get to play around a lot with Southern slang and the flora and fauna, and especially the food. So when T'Challa arrives in Alabama, of course, some crazy things start happening and he has to find a way to get to the bottom of it with his friends Zeke and Sheila. So it's a lot of fun to write. And it's on sale in September 28th. So I'm gonna read a small excerpt. And what you need to know here is uh, Zeke, Sheila and T'Challa are at the Alabama State Fair. And, uh, you know, T'Challa is getting an experience like he's never had before with all of this Southern stuff. And uh, they're just hanging out at the uh, fair. And uh, Zeke is about to point out something that uh, they want to do. So, <clears throat> wait, Zeke said, pointing. Look over there. T'Challa followed Zeke's finger. Under a massive red and white striped tent, a man was walking across a tightrope. Let's check it out, Sheila encouraged them. I love acrobats. T'Challa felt dead on his feet. He realized he must be having jet lag, but he didn't want to spoil his friend's fun, so he went along with them. They made their, they made their way over, but not before stopping at a concession stand where Zeke bought something called fried dough. T'Challa was beginning to think everything in the South was fried. He tried a piece and soon realized he was covered in white powder, which Zeke found exceedingly funny. They bustled their way through the crowd. A banner strung across the stage proclaimed, the amazing Bob, tightrope walker extraordinaire. The acrobat walked gently along the rope, long arms held out to either side for balance, testing each step with his weight. Amazing, Sheila whispered. The man stood as still as a statue for one moment. He blew out a breath and launched himself headfirst in a somersault to touch down once again. The crowd went wild. T'Challa took a closer look at the man. He was black and very tall and skinny with a short stripe of hair running along his head. <laughs> uh, he wore red and gold leggings and a shirt with no sleeves, revealing lean and wiry arms. A black pendant in the shape of a circle hung tightly around his neck. Now, the man said, still balanced on the rope, I will perform, <coughs> excuse me, I will perform a death-defying maneuver one that only the bravest acrobat would dare attempt. Excuse me. T'Challa's ears twitch. The man had an accent. West African, he surmised. An assistant handed the man a black scarf, which he reached down and took, then tied around his head, covering his eyes. The crowd murmured in anticipation. I'm going to take a drink of water. Thank you for that. The acrobat stood with his arms at his sides. He put his right foot in front of him and then bent backward at an impossible angle. Must be double jointed, Zeke whispered. The acrobat took a deep breath then flung his body into a backflip. There was a collective gas. <clears throat> Time seemed to slow down in that moment and T'Challa watched with his breath caught in his throat. Seconds seemed to last for minutes until the acrobat landed on his feet again as nimbly as a cat. He whipped off the blindfold and held out his arms in a grand gesture. The audience once again applauded wildly. The acrobat peered out over the adoring crowd as if looking for someone in particular. Finally, his eyes found T'Challa's. He held T'Challa's gaze for a long moment and then the strangest thing happened. He gave T'Challa a wide, almost malevolent grin Sheila clapped her hands furiously. Now that was pretty cool. 
Not bad, Zeke said, but T'Challa felt differently because there was something about the man that gave him the creeps. So that's the small moment from Black Panther Spellbound and it'll be out on the 28th of September. And I really hope you guys like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Our next panelist is Kendara Blake. Kendara is the New York Times bestselling author of several novels and short stories. Her work is sort of dark, always violent, and features passages describing food from when she writes while hungry. She was born in July in Seoul, South Korea, but doesn't speak a lick of Korean as she was packed off at a very early age to her adoptive parents in the United States. That might just be an excuse though, as she is pretty bad at learning foreign languages. She lives and writes in Gig Harbor, Washington with her husband and their cat and dog sons and daughters. The floor is yours, Kendara. Hey, both me and Ronald like to write about food. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us virtually. I am really excited to be here and I'm very happy that you are here because I am beyond excited to introduce you to In Every Generation. Like so excited that my normal monotone voice may actually squeak, like I may actually squeak. Um, because In Every Generation is a Buffy novel. It is a Buffy the Vampire Slayer book, which I am the hugest fan of. So it is the first book in a new trilogy set in a rebuilt Sunnydale with a new Slayer and a new gang of Scoobs. And I know that's a lot of new coming at you, but uh, it is also not. So something about me, um, I've never been sure if I could work in an established property. I've tried it before and it weirds me out. It's like being in someone else's pool and I'm just thrashing around in there. And I feel like I'm committing all these, you know, unwitting faux pas like double dipping a chip in a shared dip bowl or something. Um, I'm a huge Buffy fan, like huge. So you wouldn't think I'd be that intimidated but I'm also a pretty big fan of the X-Files and one time I was asked to write a story in the X-Files universe and I was so uncomfortable about it that I spent 5,000 words avoiding the main characters Mulder and Scully so I wouldn't mess them up. They basically showed up twice in the whole thing, like once to knock on the door and say like, hi, we're the FBI. And then again at the end for the arrest to be like, so that was weird, huh? So, I mean, the story actually turned out okay, but I figured I'd learned a lesson that I just shouldn't do that. I'm just not comfortable. And then last year, the opportunity to write in every generation came along and I had to write it. I had to write it. I finally got to live according to the only life tenant that I have, which is don't say no to Buffy. Um, I'd never had to test that tenant before because Buffy had never asked me for anything, but uh, I figured in one day, you know, she might. And I had so much fun writing this book. Um, but back to the point about the new. My goal when writing in every generation was not for it to be new, new, new. It was actually for it to be old. I, I was writing it for every Buffy fan who had watched the show from the beginning, when it first aired, all the way up to fans who just discovered it via streaming last summer. And so I wanted in every generation to feel like settling back into a classic Buffy episode, which is what I, as a fan, want from all my new Buffy stuff. I want meetings in the library. I want acrobatic fights and pithy quips. I want Scoobies. I want training sequences. Um, I want a broody hot demon with a past. And I definitely wanted a watcher in Tweed. And I think you're really going to like that part when you find out who it is. Um, so I don't know if you remember last summer, you know, last summer, it seems like a million years ago, time is a blur, fast and slow, starts and stops, what are days? Uh, but it was kind of a downer. Last summer was a downer and writing in every generation gave me almost to my only joy. And that's what I hope it is for you and for your readers, just fun with a capital F, like just nostalgia candy. I put a ton of Easter eggs in there 
for fans of the original show. I put a ton of references to the show, a ton of references to the cast, and some of them are very obscure and I'm extremely excited to find out if people pick up on them. Um, I also got to write my absolute favorite characters, which was surreal. I'm not going to tell you exactly who shows up, leave a little bit for surprises, but our new Slayer is Frankie Rosenberg, the daughter of Willow Rosenberg. So you know that Willow is there in, at the very least. So without further ado, I would like to read a very short snippet from one of the opening chapters. Um, the first episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer was called Welcome to the Hellmouth. So I wanted to call the first part of the book Welcome to New Sunnydale High, which if you're a Buffy fan, you know, is basically the same thing. So in every generation, part one, welcome to New Sunnydale High. Sunnydale High had been rebuilt so many times that it was known among the students as the thing that wouldn't die, unlike many of their classmates. But this iteration of the school had fared pretty well. Following the town's complete destruction in that freak sinkhole incident in the early 2000s, it had remained in mostly good shape. Sure, there'd been some flooding in the basement when the foundation proved less than stable, but after the sinkhole, that was almost expected. And then there was that time that the sewer main broke and mudded out the quad, but no one was hurt. And after a short symposium titled Everybody Poops, life went on quietly, serenely. As quietly and serenely as life had ever gone on in Sunnydale, California, former home of Buffy the Vampire Slayer and her Scooby gang, and proud former owner of its very own Hellmouth. But that had been a long time ago. The Hellmouth had been destroyed and the town rebuilt, and Sunnydale residents were of the hardy sort, the blissfully ignorant sort. The willfully ignorant sort, Frankie Rosenberg thought, as she sat in the middle of the quad watching her fellow students chew through their lunch period, the vast majority of them had no idea of their schools and their town's storied history. They didn't know about slayers and demons and vampires and that one time the whole town lost the ability to speak for a weekend. They didn't know and when confronted with even a tidbit of it, they didn't seem interest in the slightest. It was the damnedest thing. But Frankie knew. You didn't get to be the daughter of the strongest witch in a generation and walk around not knowing. So she always kept one eye on the school just in case. She stared at it, all its fancy new marble and shiny windows looking all solid and strong and permanent. Don't bet on it, she whispered and bit into her plant-based meat sandwich. So that's it, that's the opening, just a little piece of it. It is on sale January 4th, and I really hope you guys like it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kendara. I was chuckling the whole time you read that passage. Uh, I'm very excited about that book. Uh, we'll now hear from Pam Munoz Ryan. Pam is a New York Times bestselling author and US nominee for the International Hans Christian Andersen Award. She has written over 40 books, including Esperanza Rising, Becoming Naomi Leone, Writing Freedom, Paint the Wind, The Dreamer, and Echo, a Newbery Honor Book and the recipient of the Kirkus Prize. She is the author recipient of the National Education Association's Human and Civil Rights Award, the Virginia Hamilton Literary Award for Multicultural Literature, and is twice the recipient of the Pura Belpre Medal and the Willie Cather Award. Other honors include the Penn USA Award, the Americas Award, the Boston Globe Hornbook Honor, and the Orbis Pictus Award. She was born and raised in Bakersfield, California, but now lives near San Diego with her family. Many of her stories reflect her half Mexican heritage. Take it away, Pam. Hi everyone, um, a shout out to all the librarians and publishing friends. I wish we were all together in one place. Um, looking forward to that time again. And thank you to Disney Publishing for making it possible for me to be with you today. So a few years back, um, Samantha McLaren at Disney, um, who had been a fan of Esperanza Rising for a number of years, um, came to me um, and asked me if I would be interested in writing an original Latina princess story. And I was intrigued and I thought this would be a really great opportunity to um, create a princess that we might not have seen before. So this is a story of a girl who grows up privileged but has 
great hopes for changing the way things have always been. She's um, a girl who has environmental concerns and political ones. Um, her village considers the monarch butterfly and the oyamel fir forest to be sacred. And it's there during the spectacle of their arrival in the midst of a kaleidoscope of butterflies that something magical happens that gives her the power to see the very near future. A neighboring king wants to buy thousands of acres of the land um, to, uh, of her father's kingdom to strip the land of the trees um, for lumber and he will do anything to get it, including taking the village hostage at a very vulnerable moment. So a series of events happen which spare Somar from being kidnapped as well, but now with this gift that the butterflies have bestowed upon her, she is valuable to the greedy king as well. So with the help of her pet bird, um, a resplendent quetzal, and a wise kuandua, and even a talking um, doll, um, she sets out to save not only her kingdom, but the monarch butterfly's existence. She embarks on a dangerous journey down the Devil's River, and she meets Berto, a river boy who helps her maneuver the um, terrifying rapids and a labyrinth of caves. So this excerpt is um, when Solomar is in the sacred Oyama forest with her grandmother and has just watched the first wave of monarch butterflies arrive um, during their migration. Abuela, look, Solomar pointed to the Oyamel firs. As Abuela came closer, she admired the butterfly covered trees and murmured, las mariposas, beautiful. They are fitting ornaments for the sacred firs. And I see you have decorated yourself as well. She pointed to the elaborate crown of flowers on Solomar's head. Just call me King Solomar. Abuela clicked her tongue and shook her head. A childhood fancy, although your hair is as short as most kings, you look more like a rough and tumble forest elf than a princess. Where does it say what a princess must look like, asked Solomar. Besides, I'm not one yet, it's not official. I stand corrected, said Abuela, almost a princess, and it is understood what royalty should look like. Your birthday is only a month away when you will become, I know, I know, Princess Solomar's the boy, never in line to the throne, and forever in the shadow of my brother, Prince who will be king, which will make me not king. Why is that a problem? It is simply the way of the land, said Abuela. Isn't it clear? The king chooses, decides, announces, and resides above all he commands, and everyone obeys. I don't want to just follow the leader. I want to have a say. And if you were king, asked Abuela, Oh, I have so many. I've been in this book about a round table where many people advise the king. I think it should be surrounded by men and women. I'd allow everyone to vote for those who sat around it. And one of the first things I propose is that I and other women could go on the expedition each year. If that was the case now, I'd be going tomorrow. In the morning, her father, King Sebastian, and her brother, Prince Campion, would have the enviable task of leading a caravan of mountain to the grandest marketplace in the 12 kingdoms where the much coveted handiwork of the artisans of San Gregorio would be displayed, peddled, and bartered. It isn't fair that Campion is allowed to go, and I am not. Abuela waved a finger. It's a treacherous journey. Abuela, in some cases, the women are better writers, the actual artisans were charming and knowledgeable salespeople. If I was king, it's how things have always been. Abuela patted Solomar on the knee and how things are for now. Solomar slumped and muttered, the way of the land. I'll bring this up to your father again tonight. He has enough on his mind preparing for tomorrow. Wait at least until the expedition Yes, Solomar smiled. Yes, I will never give up. Thank you for visiting with us today. Thank you so much, Pam. Next up is Lori M. Lee.
Lori has been writing stories since the third grade and earned a bachelor's degree in creative writing. She specializes in science fiction and fantasy and has two YA series to her name, Gates of Thread and Stone and Shaman Born. She's also a contributor to several anthologies, including A Thousand Beginnings and Endings and Color Outside the Lines. Lori was born in a village in the mountains of Laos, which her family was forced to escape when she was just an infant. They re relocated to a refugee camp in Thailand for a few years and moved permanently to the United States when she was three. Now she lives in Wisconsin with her husband, kids, and excitable Shih Tzu. Welcome, Lori. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I will be reading an excerpt from Pahuan the Soul Stealer. Um, it is a middle grade contemporary fantasy. Um, but first, I actually want to talk a little bit about what inspired the book. My earliest stories that I remember are what are called Daneng, which are the Hmong oral folk tales that my mom and brothers used to tell me. Some of them were the kind that explained the universe, like how the world was created, which you will learn about in Pahua, or why the rooster wears or has a red crown. Um, but most were ghost stories about vengeful spirits or demons that wore the faces of tigers. Um, so I was absolutely obsessed very early on with the speculative and with ghost stories. In fact, my earliest short stories were horror, um, but I also fell utterly in love with fantasy, particularly portal fantasy. I was enamored with this idea that if I could just find the places in the world where the veil between the mundane and the magical were thinnest, I could enter that world like someone stepping through a fairy ring and discover that magic was real. So writing became one of the ways that I could do that. Um, in Pahua and the Soul Stealer, the magic and mythology is drawn directly from Hmong shamanism. Uh, Hmong shamanism is strongly based in animism, which is the belief that all things have a soul from plants and animals to certain inanimate objects. Like for example, some Hmong believe in hearth spirits that protect the home or door spirits that prevent any wicked spirits from entering the home. Um, many traditional Hmong also believe that when a person falls gravely ill, it's generally due to accidental interaction with an evil spirit or that your soul has been lost or stolen. And in those cases, a shaman would need to perform rituals to enter the spirit realm and locate the lost soul and bring it back to its body. And that became the premise of Pahua. So Pahua has always been able to see spirits and not just the human spirits like ghosts, but she can see the nature spirits like wind spirits or the guardian spirits um, or animal spirits like her best friend who is a talking cat spirit named me. Um, but this gift leads to her accidentally unleashing a ghost from the local haunted bridge and as a result this ghost steals her brother's soul so now Pahua has to venture into the spirit realm to retrieve him before he's lost forever um, so I'm going to read a really short excerpt from when she is about to encounter this bridge ghost June and I left the school following the others across the playground toward the hiking trail in the woods as we continued down the shaded path the air grew cooler and the soft earth muffled our footsteps Dandelion spirits with tufts of frothy hair emerged from the weeds to trot at my heels, trailing silver fluff. Your name is Bahua, right? June asked. Me was perched on her head now, doing his best impression of a hat. Yeah, I said, surprised. How'd you know? She smiled, flashing her braces. I pay attention. My dad says I'm good at remembering little details. I winced at the idea of my name being a little detail, but she probably didn't mean it to sound rude. Are you new here? I asked, eager to change the topic. Yeah, we're from Chicago. We've only been here like a month. It's so much quieter than in the city. Our old apartment was next to this bar that played local bands every Saturday, and my dad and I would dance. She kept going, and I tried to listen. Honest, I did, because I wanted her to like me. But I could tell by the way my stomach grew heavier and heavier that we were getting closer to the bridge. Almost everyone I knew had a story about this bridge being haunted. To be fair, I didn't know a lot of people, and most of them were adults, like our neighbor, Mr. Taylor, who always smelled like wet dog food. Also, the bridge looked like it should be haunted, with crooked wooden boards that had black mold and nails eaten through by rust. There was even a sign warning people away, but I was probably the only person in the whole town who could say with absolute certainty that the stories were true. All human spirits are creepy, at least they are to me, but most of them are harmless. The recently dead, waiting for the funeral rituals that would release their soul into Dathe, the spirit realm, 
just sort of mope around looking depressed. Not that I blame them. The older spirits who, for one reason or another, who were never released, mostly keep to themselves, scaring the locals only on rare occasions. I don't blame them either. If I was stuck in one place for all eternity, I'd find my fun however I could too. But then there are the genuinely scary ones. They're literally the worst. My guess was that the bridge spirit was one of those. My mom had warned me to stay away from there and before today I'd obeyed. The sensation gnawed at my insides, made the hair stand up on the back of my neck and filled me with a cold so intense it burned. People who are tuned to spirits can be affected by them even if they can't see or hear them. And I'm especially sensitive. I was picking it up already. The awareness of something very old and very angry. I put my arms behind my back to hide the way my skin prickled as the chill spread inside me. Maybe Pahua Mo, 11 year old nobody, was scared of a bridge, but I didn't have to be her right now. I pretend to be someone braver, a warrior princess setting out to vanquish an evil sorcerer or a secret government experiment, part machine and part vampire bat, bent on destroying the mad scientist who created me. My imaginings broke off when we reached the bridge. The trees ended at a steep bank studded with rocks. The tree spirits had gone quiet and the dandelion spirits had peeled away some time ago. I told myself all that was normal. Lots of earth-based nature spirits didn't like water spirits, which were particularly nasty. The cold inside me became a sick, sinking feeling, like the ground beneath my feet had turned to quicksand. There was something here that wasn't right, something that was not to be disturbed. Like an idiot, I ignored it. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Our final panelist today is Ryan T. Higgins. Ryan is the author and illustrator of the number one New York Times bestselling, We Don't Eat Our Classmates, as well as the New York Times bestselling Mother Bruce series, which includes Be Quiet, Hotel Bruce, Bruce's Big Move, and Santa Bruce. Mother Bruce received the E.B. White Read Aloud Award and an Ezra Jack Keats New Illustrator honor. As a child, Ryan subsisted on cartoons, cheese sandwiches, and tree climbing. At the age of four, he decided to become a cartoonist and he's been creating his own stories ever since. He lives and works in Southern Maine with a menagerie, including dogs, cats, geckos, a tortoise, his wife, and his animal loving children. The floor is yours, Ryan. Hi, right, thanks so much. Um, quick question. Um... Are you guys seeing, which screen are you seeing? You've seen the, the cover? Yes. Oh, okay, great. All right. Um, so, hi, thanks so much everybody for tuning in. Um, it's been a bit of a weird year where authors and illustrators and folks like us don't get to go out and see our audience. Um, so we're, we're all really thankful that you're able to tune in and hang out with us digitally. So thanks so much. Um, so this story um, uh, was a lot of fun to write. Some stories need, you know, lots of planning and lots of thinking and, you know, kind of mapping out the story ahead of time. And some stories more or less write themselves. This story was originally not about a porcupine. It was about a sloth who was um, trying to find just the right tree. But when my editor, um, asked a very simple question, it changed the story drastically and it wrote itself. Uh, and without any further ado, I'm just going to read it to you. So here we go. This is Norman didn't do it. Yes, he did. Norman was a porcupine. Norman's best friend was Mildred. Mildred was a tree. Norman and Mildred did everything together. Strike one, bounce. Okay, you know what? Hold on. Sorry, everybody. I have the wrong screen up here. It keeps doing that. Don't mind me. I want this one. All right. And Ryan, if you want to turn your camera on, I'm sure people would love to see you. Okay. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, there we go. Did I get the wrong one again? I did. What is going on here? Let's enter reader. I don't know why this isn't reading. Okay, can, this, can you guys see this okay? Does it look weird? All right, let's just try this. All right, strike one, bounce, bounce. Cheep, cheep. You're right, Mildred. It is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. I love playing tree together. Yay, you win. Norman was happy with the way things were. Okay, one more chapter, then it's lights out, Mildred. 
Norman and Mildred, Mildred and Norman. Just the two of them. Until one day, pop, there was someone else. And who is that? It was another tree. Suddenly, it was no longer just Norman and Mildred. Now it was Norman and Mildred and the other tree. This did not sit well with Norman. Norman began to worry. What if the other tree wanted to be friends with Mildred? What if Mildred liked the other tree? <gasps> what if Mildred liked the other tree more than she liked Norman? Norman kept a careful eye on the other tree. Whoosh. Bounce, bounce, bounce. He watched as Mildred and the other tree grew closer. And closer. Cheep, cheep, cheep. Sigh. And closer. You're playing tree without me? Life wasn't the same. Fine, you win. Then it happened, the worst possible thing. Touch. Mildred and the other tree grew too close together. This was the last straw. This is the last straw. Even though in this case, there were no straws, just branches. Norman could not lose his best friend, not to the other tree. Something had to be done. Norman planned and he planned until his plan was just right. Then, under the cover of night, Norman dug up the other tree and took it far away, very far away, very, very far away, to a place where the other tree would never come between Norman and Mildred ever again. And just like that, the other tree was gone. Norman and Mildred were back together. Just the two of them. But it wasn't the same. Other tree? What other tree? Oh, that other tree. I don't know what happened to the other tree. I didn't do anything. Maybe it went on vacation. Maybe it moved. How should I know? There, there, Mildred, you still have me. Soon, Norman started to think about Mildred without her new friend. Norman started to think about the other tree all alone out there. Norman just started to think about himself and what he did. What if someone had seen him? Let's think. There was the moon, there were the stars, there was the grass and the trees. Oh no, the trees. What if they saw me? What if one of the trees tells another tree? Who tells another tree? Who tells another tree? Who tells Mildred? What am I going to do? What have I done? What if digging up your friend's friend in the middle of the night and taking that friend very, very far away was not the right thing to do? What if it was the wrong thing to do? Stop staring at me, Mildred. Trip, thud. Norman had hit rock bottom. I have hit rock bottom. Something had to be done. Norman planned and he planned again. Then he went back to where he had left the other tree to try to undo what he had done. Yes, you're right. I went a little overboard. But in my defense, you were touching branches. Norman knew life was going to be different. Look who's back, Mildred. And that was okay. 
he might even like it. Norman and Mildred and the other tree. Just the three of them. And who is that? The end. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Brian. And a huge thank you again to all of you for taking the time to speak with us about your latest books. We will now enter the quiz portion of the webinar. Um, remember, in a separate window or on your phone, open https colon slash slash kahoot.it. I believe somebody has dropped it in um, chat. Authors, feel free to enable your videos so we can hear from you during the course of this ruthless competition a uh, friendly quiz, rather. Uh, from here, I'll turn things over to Dina, the School and Library Marketing Director at Disney Publishing Worldwide, so we can get started. Thanks so much, Sarah. And you guys, oh my God, those, all of your readings were amazing. Um, we haven't done this in about a year and a half since the last in-person ALA Midwinter, and I'm reminded of how much I really love these story times. So thank you guys, you were all great. All right, I am going to share my screen and get you all the Kahoot pin. So if you're at kahoot.it, enter the game pin 484732. It's on your screen, 484732. Let's see who we've got joining. Oh my goodness, we got a lot of people coming up. It's gonna be great. We'll let some more people join. By the way, I also have to say, it's so great seeing so many familiar names in the participant list. So thank you all for joining us. And hello to all the folks that I haven't met yet. Um, hopefully we'll all see each other in person one of these days. All right, we've got a lot going here. Authors, feel free to play if you want, although you are not eligible for prizes. <laughs> all right, we're gonna give it a little more time and then I'm gonna lock it and we'll get started. All right, let's see how we're doing. Oh, we're still going. 150, all right, all right. It looks, this is like waiting for your popcorn to pop and waiting for that last kernel. So try to make sure I don't burn the popcorn here. I want to make sure we have enough time for everything. All right, we're going to get started. Let's get going. Two, one. All right, first up, what is the name of the city goat group who provided those amazing goat poses for I'm on it? Is it the Philadelphia Goat John, Philly's Greater Good Goats, the Philly Goat Project, or Gritty City Goatery? All right, let's see who, how we did. All right, we got quite a few people who got that one right. Let's see where we are. All right, Lil is in the lead, close behind with Falstaff 13 and Miss C, and O.S. Miller tied. All right. I really wish it were a Gritty City Goatery. I do too. <laughs> Andrea. I have one quick question for you. Yeah. Uh, did you know that you wanted to write a book about goats or did you fall in love with the goats and then decide I have to do a book with a goat? Oh, uh, well, they, they were unconnected, uh, basically. It started from the idea of competition and play and then came to the idea of jumping. And But the minute I heard that there was such a thing as the Philly Goat Project, immediate fan of the Philly, like ride or die Philly Goat Project. They have a goat transport vehicle whose vanity license plate is Van Goat. Oh my God. Yeah, it's That's amazing. amazing. <laughs> All right, uh, next goat, which is gonna be what I say from now on when we change slides. Next goat. Let's... What is the name of Andrea's small but serious dog? Garbanzo, spatula, trebuchet, or Duke marmalade? These are great names, all of them. All right, let's see how we did. Spatula, oh, not a lot of people got that one right, okay. Moving on to, all right, Sarah BT has taken the lead. Next, Black Panther Spellbound takes place in which Southern state? Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, Florida. We got a lot of people answering this one. Let's see how they did. All right, a lot of people were paying attention. We got a lot of great guesses on that one for Alabama. Sarah has a streak. All right, this is getting, oh, this is getting cut through. Uh, Ron, I have, uh, well, actually, I'm going to wait till our next question. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. What invented language does Ronald speak a little? Klingon, Elvish, Dothraki, or Hatties? 
see who knows Ron the best. All right, uh, people were surprised. All right, so Elvish. So Ron, uh, can I ask you to speak a little Elvish, please? Oh boy, I knew I, I knew it. <laughs> okay, here we go. It's really nerdy, put on my geek hat. Ah, Elbereth Gilthonio, Celebran Pinamiriel, O Mine Agla Elena, Nahadred Palindiriel, O Galadrimen in Arab, Banuilos Lelinathon Nefire C. Nefario. That's from the tale of Baron and Luthien. Amazing. And the that's beautiful. I'm, I'm impressed. And that's why I'm a nerd. That's okay. That's why we love you. <laughs> I have the Elvish word for fellowship tattooed on my wrist. <laughs> all right. Nice, Lori. <laughs> This is how you all come together. <laughs> all right, let's see how we're doing here. Ooh, KDF has taken the lead. All right. Next up. In every generation opens with a reference to a time when Sunnydale residents were unable to speak, caused by, let's see how our Buffy fans do, Spike in the Gem of Amara, The Gentleman, Contagious Laryngitis, or a willow spell gone horribly wrong. All right, we have a lot of Buffy fans in the audience there, I think, absolutely. So we've got a new leader, all right, Jenna F has taken control. Kendara Blake's youngest cat son is a hairless sphinx who you may have seen on her Instagram. His name is Mr. Bigglesworth, Grumple Stiltskin, Armpit McGee, or Ignacio. People have opinions, we'll see. Ah, oh, this was a tight one, all right. The answer was Armpit McGee. And Kendara, I have asked you about this before, but uh, do you have other pets at home with other interesting names that we should know about? I do. I have a Doberman named Obi Dog Kenobi. I have a Rottweiler named Agent Scully. And I have another cat named Tyrion Cadister. So Armpit McGee is clearly the outlier. I let my husband name that one. It's a great name though. <laughs> Although I have to say, now you, I feel like you have to name a pet Grumple Stillskin because I kind of love that one too. So, or maybe I'll borrow it. Armpit McGee has a similar feel to Bodie McBoatface, the research. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, William has taken a slight lead over Jenna. All right, this is gonna, this is tough. All right, next up. Pahua's best friend is a talking black kitten spirit named Miv. What do you think the Hmong word Miv means? We've got noodles, friend, Black or cat? And the correct answer is cat. Ah, people guessed wrong. All right, or maybe people aren't up on their mong. <laughs> now we're doing. Wow, William. Okay, William has the highest answer streak going so far. Jenna is still close behind. Lori's earliest stories that she wrote as a child were fantasy, horror contemporary or romance? All right, I see you guys were paying attention, horror. So um, Lori, from the excerpt you read, it definitely sounds like you're still incorporating a little horror into your stories. Is that safe to say? That was a little scary. Um, yeah, that was, I just loved ghost stories and I love like children's ghost stories particularly, which I think always ring a little creepier. <laughs> I don't know what it is about children's stories. But yeah, I was absolutely obsessed with like Arl Stein, like Fear Street and the scary stories to tell in the dark when I was like that age. Oh wow. So, <laughs> so yeah, I was this elementary kid writing uh, about teens falling in love and then being gruesomely murdered by ghosts. Or <laughs> I was in a, a very macabre child. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. We love what you're doing. <laughs> all right. Next up. Let's see how we're doing here. Oh, Jenna has retaken the lead, guys. This is getting uh, William dropped down a little bit. So now I've got Nancy in the second place spot. All right. In the book Solomar, Sword of the Monarchs, the young princess wants to protect the sacred temple of the monarchs, the Oyamel Forest, the Sword of Light, or the Book of Magic. All right, uh, not everyone was paying attention uh -oh. to the IRL forest. <laughs> but let's see how we, our, our winners are doing. Jenna's dropped down, Michelle has taken the lead. All right, and Kim is back with an answer streak of three. That's great. All right, next. 
Pam, you know, as Ryan lives near the, but I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Pam, help me out. The Batiquitos Lagoon in California, Chesapeake Bay in Maryland, Huntington Lake in California, or the Gulf of Mexico in Texas. Did I pronounce that right, Pam? Batiquitos. Batiquitos. Yeah. Batiquitos. Thank yeah. you. All right. All right. People got that right. Excellent. Got that right. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Michelle is holding on to that lead. All right. What was Norman's last straw? The two trees touching branches, Mildred playing catch with the other tree, the other tree grew taller than Mildred, or the two trees were whispering about him. Ah, uh, everybody, almost everybody got that one right. You guys were definitely paying attention. Look at that. I don't know about the rest of you. Clearly you were not listening. <laughs> it's in the drawing. No. <laughs> and Jenna has taken the lead back. Okay. All right, last question. Ryan has had a job doing which of the following? Self-publishing books, taking care of dogs at a pet daycare, counting and folding shirts, or all of the above? All right, <laughs> drawing opinions on all of the above, yes. I do so, need to do that in my presentation, so nice work, everybody. Yeah, so Ryan, quick question. When you originally sent me this, you had some other jobs listed as well. I had to cut it down to four. Uh, what are some of the ones that I didn't list here that you also did? I don't remember. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, um, hmm, hmm. I don't, do you don't have them in front of you, do you, Dana? Dana? I do not have it in front of me. Okay, so that is a question you all- Oh, you know what it was? I think it was, I think that the last one was like all but the first two, all but the last one. I think I got like really <laughs> silly with the- uh, Oh, yes. Well, these are all pretty good things. Did you have a favorite one of these three, Ryan? Yeah, self-publishing books was was more fun than the other ones. Taking care yeah, of dogs was fun. Dogs? Well, I, I liked it, but they found out that my job before that was mowing lawns. So very quickly, they just hired me and paid <laughs> me, um, the rate that I think paid as a doggy daycare person to mow their lawns, which oh. anyways. Oh, well. It was fine. I love dogs. <laughs> I have three of them. They're in the studio with me now. Oh, awesome. All right, let's see how we did here. Number three, Jason L. Great job. Yay. Number two, Michelle, well done. And our winner, number one with eight out of 12. Jenna F, all right, congratulations. <laughs> so all three of you, please send an email. Uh, Sarah will let you know where to email that to and let us know your actual full name and how to reach you and we will get your prizes to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and send this back over to Sarah. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your participation uh, in our first ever Zoom Kahoot extravaganza. This was a real blast. Uh, winners, to receive your prizes, please email webinars at booklistonline.com, referencing this webinar and providing your contact information. Tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slides, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those you see here. Booklist's third annual Graphic Novels and Libraries Month is officially here. We'll be celebrating throughout July with webinars, author and illustrator panels, a hashtag read graphic sweepstakes, podcasts, and of course, our guide to graphic novels and libraries issue, which is now free and open to everyone on our website. Go to booklistonline.com to start reading now. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get booklists for only $75. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. And one more huge thank you to our panelists, Andrea, Ronald, Kendara, Pam, Lori, and Ryan, and our sponsor, Disney Publishing Worldwide. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.